this session is called Short Shorts. If you're wondering what that means, the sort of idea is to have storytelling from five really interesting media innovators um, who are really pushing the boundaries of what journalism is and how it is perceived, moving it forward, pushing the dial. This is a concept that we at IPI very recently started working on through our Media Innovation Europe project. You can learn a little bit more about it on that uh, roll up right next to me there. Um, this project is supporting uh, media innovators over a two year window and in all likelihood beyond that with everything from financial sustainability to product development. Uh, and really kind of focusing on the process. You know, how are they re meeting their audience's needs? How are they building products to achieve their audience's needs? And how does that contribute to their sustainability? So these are some themes that will be cross-cutting today's conversation, but really it's an opportunity to learn from some really interesting media projects uh, and how they're moving the dial. We'll have six minute presentations from each of them. Um, and then we'll jump into a Q&A, so feel free to take notes and collect questions. Um, so I'm Ryan, I'll be moderating. Um, I manage the uh, IPI's innovation projects and um, yeah, look forward to hearing your questions and, 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 and uh, from the panelists here today. So the first panelist we have presenting her project is Eleanor. Thank you for coming in today. Um, she joined the OCCRP, the Organized Crime and Corruption Reporting Project in 2017 as an investigative reporter, has been cutting across all sorts of major investigative projects like the Paradise Papers, Pandora Papers, um, but she's also worked as a filmmaker for Info. This is what she'll be talking about today. Um, and even in 2021, she received the Ukrainian Honor of Profession Award in Investigative Journalism uh, for her documentary, Break the Bank. Um, so Elena, I will hand it over to you and uh, looking forward to hearing about your project. Uh, thank you, Ryan. Um, do you hear me, guys? <laughs> yes. Uh, can we please uh, turn my presentation? Um, okay, so before, while the uh, presentation is opening, uh, before I was doing uh, stories mostly on corruption, uh, like uh, follow the money stories, but then uh, when uh, uh, one year ago, or more than one year ago, Russia started full-scale war uh, in Ukraine, uh, of course we needed to change uh, some of our focuses. And um, maybe you remember, one year ago, all uh, headlines of uh, major media were full of uh, um, stories about Bucha, about atrocities of uh, Russians in Bucha, a city near Kiev. And of course, we were also thinking what uh, we can do about this uh, horrible event. Uh, and by accident, uh, we had an idea. My um, friend and uh, editor-in-chief in Ukraine, Anna Babinets, was scrolling uh, Facebook, and she saw uh, some quotes from a Telegram chat, and she showed me this. We shared this with director of OCCRP, Matt, and we said, okay, if we will get full log of this chat, uh, probably we can answer this question, like what are people talking about during the Russian uh, occupation? So, I got full log of uh, Telegram chat, uh, of residents of this building. Uh, it's uh, hundreds of people and 33 days of occupation. Can you imagine um, the amount of data? Uh, we asked uh, our OCCRP tech team to um, translate all these messages. So Matt, because he is American, can understand. And when we m are making stories, we usually cooperate with uh, different people from different countries so we can make better product and uh, how it was when I was reading all these text messages uh, first I wanted to see I have not wanted I thought I will see a lot of messages about murders some uh, fires after missile attacks but I was surprised because I saw there are many human regular conversations. Like maybe in your countries you also have these uh, building chats when uh, 
you are talking about somebody is too loud, parting too, for too long, or organizing some um, trees near your uh, building. And that was also in this uh, chat during war. People were talking about very different um, things, not just about um, murders. So um, the topics were so um, many, many topics. And we decided with Matt that we need to organize this. And we made uh, some folders with most uh, memorable episodes. There were very strange things like a Christmas light episode because a full-scale invasion started in uh, February and some people forgot, for example, to turn off Christmas light. But it was, it was it's funny, it sounds funny, but it was dangerous because the building was in front of a factory where Russians had their headquarters. And uh, residents were afraid because of these uh, Christmas lights, uh, soldiers will hit their apartments. So it's, you know, um, very confusing uh, things. After we made these episodes and identified all people, because when you are in chat, you probably uh, use nickname. And of course, if you are uh, during war, uh, it's a matter of security, because uh, people were also helping Ukrainian army, so they didn't want to put their real names in this chat. So I identified all these around 100 people, and uh, Slisva Info uh, reporters, Slisva Info is Ukrainian member center of OCCRP, uh, they went to talk with people. And so now you can see what they saw one year ago when they knocked on doors. Uh, they were actually even that people left there. We also identified them. And um, these are uh, nice characters with whom uh, um, the reporter talked. Uh, before, we thought that people uh, will be afraid to talk with journalists because it was just uh, after Ukrainian army deliberated city. And, but we were surprised because everyone wanted to talk. And we realized that they want to talk because they want uh, Russian soldiers to be punished. So they will answer on every atrocity they did. So people were very nice and open with us. And of course, when you are talking on chat, there are a lot of rumors. And as investigative reporters, uh, we uh, need to pass fact-checking uh, after the story is written. So we needed to um, confirm everything. And uh, there were an episode when people were talking about uh, young, two young Ukrainian girls uh, helping Russians, sleeping with them. Uh, taking drugs, alcohol, but it were just rumors when uh, reporters knocked on door and talk with people. So, and of course, as a, it's a very unusual experience for OCCRP to do such stories, uh, but our experience also helped us because some facts were proven with our investigative techniques. For example, there were an episode with Yellow Bus, uh, Russians didn't allow to bury um, dead people. Uh, like they said, okay, uh, take these bodies and put, it, put them in a yellow bus near the house. But when reporters came, there were no yellow bus uh, near this uh, block. Uh, but with the help of satellite, we saw that exactly on that day, the bus was there, so we confirmed this. We couldn't confirm it uh, with people, talking with people, but with satellites, we did it. I will be sure. Um, you can read more about uh, Russian war crimes on Slisvo website, and thank you. Thank you so much, Elena, for a fascinating presentation, really. Um, I have to ask, while we, while we have you here, what's, what's next? What other projects do you have going forward? How are you? continuing to move the dial on. Okay, uh, uh, Russians, because of Russians, we have a lot of work to do. Every day is uh, full of crimes. Uh, mostly all Ukrainian reporters are now war reporters. Uh, and of course we need to report about corruption inside the country, but we also have a lot of work with identifying Russian soldiers, 
because we believe that they need to be punished and uh, we cannot forget uh, all this, all this, yes. So we are identifying Russian soldiers and in, they are committed, every crime you know, they are doing this. So that's, that's please, the priority. Please follow her website. Um, you can find it either on the presentation or afterwards to continue looking into the project. It's really fascinating. Um, <laughs> Gianluca, you are next up. Uh, Gianluca is another media innovator that we have on the table here. He is a co-founder of Radar Magazine, and we've gotten to know each other quite well because he's also a participant in our current Transition Accelerator project. Um, so I know all about his project. We've been working together on growing their business model, working on crowdfunding campaigns, but I will leave it over to you to introduce Radar and how you guys are pushing the dial on journalism. Thank you. Could, yeah, could you hear me? Um, while my presentation is uploading, I present myself. I am Gianluca Liva, uh, science journalist and part of uh, Redder Magazine Collective, an independent uh, environmental magazine based in Italy. And uh, we got the honor and the pleasure to be part of the Forever Pollution Project. And uh, the Forever Pollution Project is a project involving 18 different media organizations around whole Europe. From Italy, Radar Magazine and Le Scienze, the Italian edition of Scientific American. We were uh, granted by the Germanist Fund and of course by IJ4AU and everything was coordinated by Arena for Journalism. So, the project was about poly and perfluoroalkylic substances, commonly named PFAS. Okay. And they are substances that uh, are everywhere. Non-sticky pens, clothes, cars, mobiles, medical devices, pizza boxes, food packaging, pens. They are literally everywhere. And uh, of course they are even into your blood, my blood, their blood. Okay? And they are really dangerous for our health. So, how many PFAS are? There are, uh, according to the first statistics uh, of 20 years ago, PFAS were more or less 4,000. Then they become 10,000, then 50,000, then 500,000, then 1 million, and according to the last statistics, they are more than 10 million, according to PubMed database, okay? And uh, they've got some serious, serious health consequences after getting into our blood. But uh, what is more concerning is that we barely know anything about them. We know the characteristic of 20 of them, the most famous one, like PFOA, the one used in non-sticky pens, and the PFOS used in clothes to, to get them uh, uh, waterproof, okay? <sighs> We have to track back where the pollution is. We don't know where are polluted places. We don't know exactly where this pollution are happening around Europe. So together with the colleagues, we decided to build the first ever map of PFAS pollution in Europe. And this is a white panel. So, how, how we did it. At first, we have to understand uh, how many PFAS we, has to, we have to look for. And uh, I'm hoping that this video will start right now. No, okay. Uh, I asked to our technician if they can start uh, this uh, YouTube video. So we started to organize the PFAS family. The PFAS family is made by different sub-families and every subfamily is organized in several subgroups, okay? In every subgroup, there are different substances. The, our inspiration was a US map with a peer review methodology, and we applied and we improved the same methodology used by our US colleagues, and we asked help to the best and major experts around the world to guide us in this process, okay? Unfortunately, I can't, I suppose I can't show how difficult it was 
to collect data, but in this blurred Excel file, <laughs> you can barely see a lot that there are a lot of lines, okay? Every line represents a different regional data set all across Europe, okay? Like, for example, the Vienna region, or the Salzburg region, or the Lisboa region, or the Bucharest region, okay? Every single region around Europe. We collect this data, we harmonize them thanks to Le Monde data technicians, and finally, after a, another blank page, this uh, hyperblurred uh, result is uh, some kind of map, but please believe me, it's a beautiful map, <laughs> okay? <laughs> anyway, uh, let's go on and let's talk about the result and let's keep the blurred uh, slides. The result was we individuate 20 different PFAS producing facilities. We individuate uh, 17,000 known contamination sites, 2,200 hotspot clusters, 21,000 presenting contamination sites divided in industrial sites, waste management sites, airport, military sites. Why airport and military sites? Because the fight firing, uh, the fight firing forms, the one used to, you know, to use during some fire accident, are full of these substances. And then there are 231 PFAS users. And at the end, we publish all our results in several, as I was saying before at the beginning of this presentation, European news organization. At the moment, we publish uh, uh, 75 uh, journalistic products, articles, TV broadcasting program, radio broadcasting, uh, documentaries, and so on. And everything is collected into the website foreverpollution.eu, made by Arena for Journalism, our coordinator. Okay? Our publication will go on and on and on in the next few weeks and months, okay? And um, the project will, be, uh, will continue living and informing people about uh, this brand new kind of pollution. I would like to talk uh, more about it. We can do after the presentation if you want, during lunch. And um, because there are a lot of counterintuitive uh, uh, concepts, a lot of notions, a lot of difficulties in talking about the health issues of these substances. And this is a picture taken by me and my colleague Elisabetta Zavoli, a photographer. We were lying on the ground during a freezing night uh, outside the Solvay plant uh, in Piedmont region in Italy because there was a car by the Solvay, Solvay security rangers going around the perimeter of the factory, and we do not have to be spotted. It was freezing, but that's another story. Thank you. Thank you so much, Gianluca. Really <laughs> fascinating presentation, and you can't get closer to public interest journalism from there. Before we move on, I want to have a quick follow-up question. This was recently published. What? Uh, a couple of weeks back, a month ago. The first publication was made uh, on the 23rd of February. Okay. But, uh, you know, we, are keep, we keep publishing and publishing. For example, before coming here in Vienna, I was in uh, Veneto, the region uh, with uh, the main capital city is Venice in Italy, where there is the most polluted uh, uh, place in Europe by PFAS. And we will publish a local report on that specific region. And again, we focused on uh, you know, human feelings and uh, social consequences of this kind yeah, of pollution. I wanted to ask about the reception to this mm. investigation. What, how was it received? What was the impact that you've observed? Did it meet your expectations? It was a blast. A blast because our main goal was to push on the European agenda to reach the ban not of one or two PFAS substances, but of the entire class of substances. That's the only way to be effective, okay, and to, you know, to get over this uh, huge problem. We can do an improper comparison with uh, asbestos, but it is not a proper comparison, okay? And uh, again, it will take too long, really too long, 
to talk about uh, uh, albumin protein or uh, I don't know, uh, the endocrine disruptive uh, uh, acting of PFAS or social consequences. I will tell you just one, okay? Mothers, uh, while are pregnant, can pass their entire amount of PFAS to the fetus through blood, okay? A lot of interviews I've, I did in the last uh, two weeks uh, get uh, as a result the fact that a lot of mothers got a sort of sense of guiltness, okay? And that's, you know, one of the thousand and thousand and thousand of uh, topics that we have to cover, the sense of guiltness of mothers. So, but I'm, again, it's, it's taking too long, I know, Ryan. So, sorry, and thank you again. Thank you so much, Gianluca. And, and for anyone interested in this subject, keep an eye out on Radar Magazine. They will be doing plenty more work in this area. Thank you. Um, I would like to turn now to Shante Kozma. She is the Chief Content Officer at Global Press. Uh, she is based in New York. Uh, they're very recently IPI members, I would like to add, so <laughs> welcome to the club. Um, but the Global Press is a nonprofit newsroom dedicated to training and employing women journalists in some of the world's least covered places. Um, I'd like to hand it over to you now to tell your story. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ryan. Um, no slides, just me, uh, so hopefully I can keep you engaged. But yeah, i um, really excited to talk to you all about this project. So um, the, our project spawned basically from this one idea that um, Press Freedom Day is, you know, we wanted it to be an entire month of content. So essentially, um, we, started, we started rolling out tons of statistics and data around press freedom across 11 of our, our 11 coverage countries. Um, the entire month long, and it's going to culminate with a project um, that we're calling Voices of Defiance, which is a multimedia project that takes you inside um, our 11 cov coverage countries and through the stories of local journalists who have um, you know, struggled under the duress of, of lack of press freedom. Um, and I think it's a really wonderful window into what global press does best. Um, so for number one, it would be uh, just prioritizing care. Um, it's it, it, the number one refrain that we heard from every journalist story, and these were really heart-wrenching stories, but the number one refrain we heard when we asked what is press freedom mean to you was you know, the ability to be paid well for their work and be supported by newsrooms. So it's, it's a really critical, uh, it's a, it's a really critical problem that we need to solve. Um, and, you know, just many newsrooms don't even have the mechanisms in place to support journalists. Um, at Global Press, we have a duty of care program that's very comprehensive. Um, it includes not only just training journalists to, you know, be safe on the ground, but also um, just a, a very, you know, prioritized check-in, uh, check-in schedule where we're in where our journalists we know where they are at any given time and that's incredibly important um, you know if they're traveling for a story for example you know they need to check in with someone locally and you know thank god we have never had any issues but oftentimes you know just knowing where they are how they got there the license plate number in the car it's that we owe our journalists that level of attention to to their safety it's a bare minimum that we should provide, and in my mind, it is a standard. It should be a standard across all newsrooms. Um, yeah, and then I would say uh, the second thing that I want to chat about was how important it is to, to humanize the story. So for this project, not only did we have 11 journalist stories, we had them written out. We also had voice notes, um, of them explaining, you know, what, what is press freedom to you? We have videos of them you know, sharing their story. But in addition to that, we also had a map that has all these statistics that we've been rolling out over the month. Um, but if we would have just had that map and you would have just seen those numbers, um, you know, 15 people imprisoned in Uganda uh, each year uh, uh, in 2022, um, it wouldn't really have the same impact as really hearing first person from someone who's been through this. You, When the video comes out, I. I'm telling you that you will be in tears. It's these kinds of stories, they really underscore why we do the work we do. 
Um, and I think, you know, data just couldn't do it in the same way. Um, and then I think, in general, we just need to be thinking about, uh, you know, a better model for journalism. Um, the, the, the real special part about this project is just, it's really just ingrained in what Global Press does, which is we had our, our journalists, local journalists, um, across our 11 countries, uh, across 11 countries, doing, you know, working with the source and, you know, local, local videographers. So that, those, these stories can't be told. They're not gonna happen the same way if you don't have that level of um, access the, the context to know um, how to move through the community, uh, the trust in the community. I, I'm sorry, as a journalist who's already under duress, who, who knows that they're you know, constantly receiving threats, if an American journalist were to be flown in, they are not gonna get that same story. They're not gonna have that access to that source. Um, and I really think it speaks to, you know, again, like a wholesale change that we need to make in journalism. We need to trust the people who live in these communities to tell their own stories, not send journalists abroad to cover it. Um, and I think that, you know, that comes across in just the level of insight and context and trust that you, that you receive from the source and the resulting story. Shante, thank you so much. Um, as a chief content officer overseeing projects all over the planet, how do you reconcile the question of you know having local journals tell their stories where do you actually achieve reach outside of their local context in which they're publishing um you know from an editorial standpoint you know what is your role in in the in the in the in the stories that the that the journalists in the different cities and and, and localities are that you guys are working with yeah absolutely um well i think one important thing about global press um is that we don't we have a non-assignment policy? So and I think that actually even goes back to safety again, right? If I'm not telling you what you need to cover, then you, I'm allowing you to assess. Um, well, do I feel comfortable covering this? You know, and I think that that's incredibly important. Yeah, I think that's a level of um, oversight that I think few editors would be really willing to uh, to hand over. But it's a fascinating project and interesting to rethink the role of the foreign correspondent in telling global stories. Um, Fernando, uh, another friend and, and participant in IPI's Media Innovation Accelerator. Um, you are the director of El Orden Mundial. Um, you actually published a book in 2020 um, about geopolitics called The World Is Not As You Think. Um, El Orden Mundial is the most read media uh, website in Spanish about international affairs. Um, and they're diversifying in all sorts of directions to make sure that they are reaching as many Spanish audiences out there as they can. Um, I'd like to hand it over to you to tell more about El Orden Mundial. Yeah. Thanks, Ryan. I'm very happy to be here. Um, I'm the director of El Orden Mundial. Uh, as Ryan said, uh, El Orden Mundial is the most read uh, website in Spanish about international affairs. Uh, we are not focused, we have a, a previous panel about local politics, we are in the opposite uh, place, this uh, global affairs. We don't focus on uh, Spanish politics, we don't focus on Spanish economy, uh, we, don't, we also focus on international and global uh, affairs. It's covering the entire world. Um, why? Uh, because in Spain and even in Spanish, because uh, the most of our readers and listeners are also from uh, Latin American countries. Sp as the, the, the Span Spanish is a uh, 500 million uh, speaker languages. Um, we uh, needed to provide them that huge uh, community with a, a global perspective of, uh, about uh, global affairs. Uh, but in, for example, in the United Kingdom or even in the United States, France, Italy, uh, all that countries have media focused on international affairs, but in Spain, we didn't have one. So we tried uh, to uh, develop one. Uh, why? Because what's happening in the world is important to our lives. Uh, we've, we lived uh, 
couple of years ago, a pandemic. We are living uh, trade wars. We are living an energy crisis in Europe, or even uh, a war in Europe. We are living with uh, foreign countries trying to influence in our politics. So what's happening in Brussels, in Beijing, in Washington, in whatever you uh, can imagine, it has an impact in our lives. Sooner or later, it will impact our lives. So if we don't know what's happening in the world, we don't know what to do when uh, that uh, outcome uh, come, will uh, come home. So we try to explain in an easy way uh, what's happening in the world. Um, we don't uh, publish just uh, by articles uh, or long formats or longer reads. We also do podcasts, we also do radio, we are also on TV, and now, uh, with the help of the IP, uh, we are trying to develop a video, including TikTok, uh, branch to uh, develop our, our format. Um, we are also an independent media. And why I say that? Because our main revenue source is subscription. We don't depend on um, companies, we don't depend on advertising, we don't depend on grants. We depend of the, on the support of our community, of our readers. We have more than uh, 3,000 uh, subscribers that uh, they bring us, they bring to us um, almost the 70% of our yearly incomes. So we do not depend on any other revenue sources, but only in our readers. And this is very important to us because uh, we can develop a sustainable model, a profitable model that uh, tomorrow we, won't, uh, we don't um, uh, depend on a company that don't want to uh, renew the advertising. Uh, we don't depend on a foundation that tomorrow won't uh, renew uh, its grant and we go bankrupt. Like happen to many, many media. We don't depend on advertising that tomorrow uh, advertising prices goes down and we have a huge uh, economic problem. We only depend on uh, our uh, readers. And that's the way we want to, to work on uh, because we've seen, I'm, I'm only uh, 31 years old and I've seen in Spain like many media during the a uh, 28 um, crisis uh, had huge economic problems and also with its information covering because of uh, the lack of economic independence. So we didn't want to repeat the past problems that all the other media had and uh, trying to uh, build a new path to uh, demonstrate that we can be profitable and sustainable without uh, advertising or grants or uh, whatever the, the traditional ways um, other media uh, were uh, following. And we also try to develop a new formats like maps, graphs, and infographics that to many people are very an, an easy way to understand how the world works. It's better to see a map and more entertaining than to read in an article. Because many times I don't want to read an article, I don't have time to read an article, but I have time to um, see a map or see a graphic or even listening to, to a podcast. So we always try to adapt what the user needs instead of uh, being uh, stick to the ground and uh, just waiting to the uh, audience come to, come to us. Thank you, Fernando. And, and really, EUM is a, a master class in, in, in diversification and sustainability, so I really appreciate the commitment to it. Um, two questions for you. You have a massive following on, on social media across multiple platforms. How did you achieve the scale that you did? with And, and you know, attached to that, maybe the second question would be, how do you think about your audience broadly? Of course, you're based in Madrid. Uh, but you're a Spanish language project, you have readers all over the world. You know, how do you think about the different segments that you are targeting and how does that fit into your core business model? Uh, regarding to the first question, we have 300,000 followers on Twitter, 60,000 on Instagram, and I don't know, uh, 100,000 on Facebook, um, and in LinkedIn, I, I don't know. Um, how did we uh, build that? with uh, quality content. I don't believe in uh, clickbaiting. 
I don't believe in uh, breaking news. I believe in a good content, pub uh, publish, work in uh, the time that is necessary to publish a, a good work in a way that your public is demanding. Uh, because the audience will appreciate that uh, effort. And in many years, also with the golden age of Twitter, not now, um, we had a, 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 a huge um, uh, grow, growing uh, well, years, uh, but always trying to fit into what the user needs. And um, the, um, the second question, it's, it's difficult because we have one of the main uh, income sources about uh, in uh, our community is Spain because it's uh, uh, one of the, the, the richest uh, countries. But it's, it's difficult to adapt to the cultural context of each audience comes from. It's not always to talk uh, to someone in Mexico, to someone in Mexico, or Argentina, or in Spain, or in Peru, or in Chile, and Colombia, etc. Um, so it's very difficult to adapt to that communities. But in the way that we can do that, we try to. Because, um, for example, when we publish um, something about Spain, we are not thinking about the Spanish audience. We are thinking about how a Mexican reader, how a Colombian reader want to know about Spanish politics, and vice versa, because maybe we can uh, make a podcast or uh, write an article about the political situation in, in Colombia, for example. Uh, we try to think what a Mexican reader or a Spanish reader want to know about that issue. Fascinating. It seems like there's an interesting dialogue between your project and Global Press, but maybe we can get into that later. I would like to um, now introduce the final speaker, Francois Embra. He is a tried and true radio journalist. He's been at a variety of radio stations in Cote d'Ivoire, um, started his career in Abidjan at a private radio station, uh, and was eventually the editor-in-chief of Fendix Radio in um, Boaque, Cote d'Ivoire. Um, tell us about the project that you've been working on so far. Thank you very much. Um, I'm from Côte d'Ivoire. Côte d'Ivoire is a country of West Africa with uh, 28 million of uh, people. And um, I work in the second biggest town of the country. If you remember, in 2002, um, a rebellion occurred in Avricos. And from this time until uh, two. 2020, we noticed that we go from crisis to crisis. As a journalist, what is my role? What can I do exactly to help my country? I've decided to leave the political uh, uh, capital city to get in this second biggest town of the country. Um, at the beginning, I was uh, I, I work with media. But with the time, I've decided to, to stay as a freelance journalist just to get time to uh, perform my different activities toward my community as a journalist. So uh, the birth of uh, social media and uh, artificial intelligence. Uh, I talked to all of, most of the young people in the area because I noticed that all the crises that happen in uh, my country is through uh, social media and uh, uh, artificial intelligence that people call young people uh, uh, to join the politician for, uh, I can say, starting the different activities linked to crisis. I say, okay, if you use a network, you use social media as tool for, I mean, starting the crisis, it's mean that can use the same tool for solutions. Uh, and uh, I start uh, working uh, in the domain of training. Training first, young people, because most of the time, because they don't have job, that they're always following the politicians. So I train them how to use social media for selling their products. Most of the time, they are in rural areas. Those who are students, they use social media, but they don't know exactly. They think, most of them think that it's just for getting friends. And I train them how to use social media for uh, selling the vegetable, how to use social media to get partnership for selling products, how to use uh, artificial intelligence for selling. 
a, a simple example. They grow a tomato in the, the area of Yamsukro. Yamsukro is the political capital city of the country where there is the, the first and the biggest basilica of the world. When uh, they sell their products, they don't know exactly at which price they can sell their product. I just tell them, take your phone, ask your artificial intelligence, where can we find a new partner that is near Yamsukro for buying my tomatoes? And one second, there is a result. And one second, there is a result. It's permit them to sell easily their products. And when they know that I do this for them without anything, without, it's free of charge. When I go toward them to talk to them about peace, it's very easy for them to listen to me and say, yes, if this man help us to find solution to sell our product, it means that if he's speaking about peace, it's possible that he can show us other way. And at the same time, I uh, go to my colleague journalists to tell them that using uh, artificial intelligence is very important for us in the way that if you want to find information, it's very easy for you. You don't have car, you don't have bicycle, you don't have motorcycle. How is it possible to find easily an information in a very, I mean, uh, far area? Just intelli artificial intelligence can help you. And when they try, they see that it's really important and it helps them find uh, information easily and give the right information before the, I can say the bad one that come to, to activate crisis. So now, journalists in my area knows that uh, with artificial intelligence, it's very easy to get information. And they can even um, work on a deep topic. Let's say that in the capital city of my country, Abidjan, most of the journalists are there. In Cote d'Ivoire, when you talk about press, you can see red press, I, I mean uh, green press, is for those on power, and uh, blue one, those on oppositions. If you're not blue, you're not green, it means that sometimes you become enemy of some of the politicians and people working in these different groups. So uh, at the same time, I ask NGOs, this is um, the logo of the NGO, uh, uh, Africa Op, and I ask them, to what extent can you help me to create peace condition? As a journalist, they say, we provide you computer, we provide you room. That's meaning I can even gather all the young people in the same room and show them how to use positively, um, I can say, uh, artificial intelligence and uh, social network. Today, my radio station that I've created with some of my colleagues, we, we, we got the first prize of the national web radio. So uh, I would like to continue with other partners coming from other countries, uh, but how? Sometimes it's difficult, but if you want to reach an objective, don't care about the obstacle that you find on the way. Uh, because if I work for 10 years without any wage, I can say without any salary, it's not now that I have my own car for going through the different areas that I will stop my activities. So this is a very important topic, very important uh, project for me, because uh, the economy of our country is based on agriculture. And for me, when there is crisis, it's very difficult for the community to sell their product. So the topic is just uh, artificial intelligence, social uh, network for peace and for all. This is all. Thank you, Francois. Um, to one question and, and maybe a comment. Um, what You talked a lot about the opportunities of artificial intelligence, um, especially in, in local contexts within Cote d'Ivoire. What, what does it really take to onboard that skill set and that kind of technology use um, you know, in different localities with different people? Um, and my maybe comment or question would be, um, what lessons do you have in the experience you've had with artificial intelligence um, using it as a form to communicate, to operate in crisis for media that are in the audience and um, you know, outside of Cote d'Ivoire? Okay. Um, as far as this level is concerned, uh, let's say that in every course there is uh, the sector of mine 
illegal uh, mining activities is very uh, permanent in my country. And s some of the time, the, the crisis starts there. I wrote an article, I said, um, illegal mining poison in our uh, foods. It's not because there is poison that people take to put in our food, but the water that people use for drinking, uh, there is a pollution of water. So at the beginning, when I don't know how to use uh, really the artificial intelligence, I get on the uh, um, Play Store and I just put uh, intelligence artificial, uh, or artificial intelligence, and then I see uh, an application that can permit me just I log on this, uh, uh, I download this application and I ask him here, can you find me an area where uh, you think crisis can happen due to the pollution of water? I have the answer. And even this, this form, yesterday I asked the same question to see um, if intelligence, artificial intelligence work everywhere. I'm in Africa and I left to Vienna. It, it, does the same Afri uh, African intelligence artificial work here? And the answer is yes. So that's permit me. When I do at the beginning, it seems like it's a game, but when I use it, it's very easy for me to identify the places where um, crisis can happen due to this specific topic. So um, the journalists, you know, Africa, stay Africa. We believe when we see the experiences. And now, in the different areas of the, my country with the journalists, there are more than 250 local journalists. And these journalists work for most of time for medias. But the problem is that uh, we less than 10 journalists out of 250 that speak English because we are all Francophone countries. So the fact to share experience with international journalists permit me to get the right way for using uh, um, artificial intelligence. Thank you so much, Francois. Thank you. Um, you've heard enough from me. Um, I'd love to open it up to the field for questions. Um, if you have any questions, let us know. But um, do just introduce yourself and uh, specify who you're asking the question to. Any hands? Is everyone, is everyone too hungry to ask a question? Yes, up here. Thank you for your presentations. I, I have a question for, for um, Elena. Um, I was wondering, how were you able to uh, obtain the logs of Telegram uh, uh, conversations and if um, maybe I missed this during your presentation, but uh, I was wondering if it was, you know, like a sort of connections with the, the people who were there, or it was more of a technical, you know, endeavor. Uh, thank you for the question. Um, it was um, like, you know, when there is a building, uh, there is a registry of uh, people who are living there. Uh, then you can find them on social networks or their phone numbers. So I tried this and just asked that, oh, I saw something published, but can you please share the full uh, log? Uh, but the person who shared this, uh, he, she said, uh, I don't want to be uh, named. So like this, uh, you use these uh, investigation tools to find what you want. Any other questions? It looks like there's one back to the right. Two, in fact. Just introduce yourself and, and, and let us know who you're, who you're asking the question to. Uh, hi, my name is John Allen from Kenya. My question is to Francois. Um, you obviously have done something very interesting and disruptive, especially for the people who take advantage of the low prices that um, the people that you're, you're really marketing this solution to um, have suffered from. What's the reaction been um, from those people who have taken advantage of farmers in the past? And is there support for the kind of training that you're doing to be able to you know, spread it out throughout um, um, Côte d'Ivoire? 
sorry, finally, these are actually three questions. And finally, what's been the response, um, especially at you know, a government or policy level, to the kind of initiative that you have um, in terms of training uh, people on the ground? Thanks. Okay, thank you very much. Um, most of my activities uh, are in the area of Beke. Beke is the area where the, the rebellion, the rebellion in Africa occurs because is most of the time there that people have so much problem. Uh, the response is that today, if you get in the area, I've started my training since um, 2014. Today, if you get in the Beke area, um, you see that young people don't have the same way of reacting life in the past time. Today, they use internet for even sensitizing people to not get uh, in the, the active activities with politicians so that it creates other crises. We go in no, near the uh, regional and uh, local elections. It will be on, on the September. But you see that young people themselves organize small activities of training at the university, American Corner. And there, they teach young people that if they have, want to get a peaceful environment, it's up to them to create their own activities, I mean, entrepreneurship, without following always the government. But the response of the government this time, when the police, uh, um, the police officers, when the military organize activities, they always call me to show them the strategies, how I manage with young people so that all the time, if they call young people come in this activity, they say, uh, is Francois there? They ask me the, the question to know, are you a journalist or are you a leader? I say I'm a journalist and I'm a leader at the same time because journalist is normally someone that contributes to the development of his community. I still go on writing on my press. I still going on broadcasting. But I think my broadcast can really help a community. So I, I can just say that it's a positive response from the government. Uh, the only fact is that they don't see me on green price. They don't see me on blue one. And I'm sure that they're asking a question, what kind or who is exactly Francois? And my answer is, is someone that wants to contribute to his community development. That's all. I think there's another question in the back, right? Yeah. Hi, I'm Agnieszka from Poland, and I have a question for Fernando, because you said that such a big chunk of your uh, funding comes from audience, which is amazing, and I'm sure a lot of nonprofits would love to see that. Uh, the audience is so supportive. I just wanted to ask, um, how did you introduce that model and convince people that it's worth paying for the content you're providing? Was it like a paywall or was it subscription? Uh, like, what were the tires that you went through the funnel? Thanks so much. Thanks for your, your question. We have two uh, subscription, a uh, monthly one and a yearly one. Um, why how, or how to convince people to pay for news? That's the uh, big question. Um, I think there are only two ways. The first is listening what people need from you. And the second one is providing them with a good quality content. Um, I think one of the biggest mistakes in, in media is uh, produce a lot of content is like flooding the ecosystem and okay one of your articles will go to Google discover and get will get a, a lot of uh, readers but uh, when you um, listening to people uh, when you try to provide them with a good quality content people is smarter than uh, we usually think and they know how to recognize when you treat them with respect and quality. And if you do that regularly and along the time, you will uh, get the, 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 not the seeds, but the, the, the fruit of your, of, your, of your work. So I encourage to be patient and working on a long term, because if you, if you do a, a good uh, work and uh, with a long term vision, you will, you will get your, your prize. Thank you, Fernando. I think there's one more quick question up here.
Hi, I'm Lucia Sikorová, journalist from Czech Republic. I would like to ask Gianluca uh, regarding these environmental topics. Um, where is the young audience? Did you make any good uh, experience uh, how to reach out to, to, the, to the audience and especially the young people uh, on a, a, any specific uh, social network or how do you spread your very important content? <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. So we got several responses uh, in, I'm talking about my own experience from uh, uh, several places in Italy. And um, it was uh, not surprising, but uh, you know, I was uh, happy to see how we were contacted by uh, a community in Tuscany, one in Sicily, one near Milan. The Veneto activists asked us for more and more and more. They offer us uh, a lot of support, okay? And this kind of contacts are keeping going on, okay? So probably at the end of this panel, after opening my email, okay, I will find some other messages asking me to go somewhere in Italy to talk and to investigate about their cases of PFAS pollution, okay? Quick anecdote about the Veneto activist, again, in the Venice area. Uh, there is a trial in court going on, and they asked me to cover the trial. And uh, four days ago, uh, in court, there was uh, Robert Billot, the lawyer by the movie Dark Waters. The character was interpreted by Mark Ruffalo, but that's another story, okay? So, uh, there are different uh, needs from different parts of Italy, and Radar Magazine become a sort of a hub for this kind of request. All right, I think that's all we have time for, unfortunately. I wouldn't want to cut into anyone's lunch period, so um, let's give a round of applause to the, to the speakers today.